we will essentially be moving back to phase 3 heightened alert. It's not quite the full phase 3. We call this phase 3 heightened alert because there are still these uh, restrictions in place. Reopening in two steps. From Monday, group sizes will increase from 2 to 5, but dining in will not resume until the following week. You're watching The Big Story live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Hairi Antudiman. You can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. With new COVID-19 cases in the community steadily dropping, Singapore will begin allowing more activities to resume. And this brings about a new term for us to get familiar with, that is Phase 3 Heightened Alert, which will be carried out in two stages. The first stage of easing will start from next Monday, June the 14th. Now sharing the details, this afternoon, the multi-ministry task force on COVID-19 stressed that reopening will be done in a cautious and controlled manner. Uh, we did not go into a full and painful circuit breaker to control this latest round of outbreaks. Instead, we took a targeted approach in identifying and managing the key areas of risk. And we coupled that with aggressive testing, extensive contact, contact tracing and accelerated vaccination. And this strategy has proven to be effective in bringing cases down and in controlling the spread. So now, we are able to exit Phase 2 heightened alert and resume more activities and we will do so in a controlled manner. We will essentially be moving back to Phase 3 heightened alert. It's not quite the full Phase 3. We call this Phase 3 heightened alert because there are still these uh, restrictions in place. And that's because we are reopening in a cautious and controlled manner and maintaining very strict controls at our borders. We need all of these controls in place until our vaccination rates are higher. Here's what we can look forward to from Monday. The group size limit will increase from 2 to 5 people. The cap of two distinct visitors per household per day will also go up to 5. But you should continue to limit your social gatherings to no more than two a day. The operating capacity limits for attractions, cruises, museums and public libraries will go up as well from 25 to 50%. Size limits for events like movie screenings, live performances, worship services and marriage solemnizations will also be increased. And pre-event testing is a must for events with more than 50 attendees. If the situation remains under control in the coming weeks, a further reopening will take place from June 21st. That's when mask-off activities can resume at places like FMB establishments where group sizes for dining in will be kept at 5. Gyms and fitness studios with safe distancing of at least 2 metres between people and at least 3 metres between groups as well as tuition and enrichment classes with in-person teaching for those 18 years old and above and below. Wedding receptions and banquets involving up to 100 attendees, including the wedding couple and with pre-event testing required, and live performances that involve singing and playing of wind instruments. Mr Wong explained the strategy for this step-by-step -step reopening approach and what Singaporeans can expect to see in the weeks and months ahead. With increased activity levels as we reopen and resume more activities, we must be prepared to see more cases. Because, as we all know, there are still hidden cases in the community which can easily flare up, especially with this highly transmissible variant. We won't be able to eradicate all of these hidden or cryptic cases in the community, so we will have to learn to live with the virus and then try our best to minimise transmission and minimise the risk of large clusters breaking out. We will take more aggressive, localised actions and we will try our, ve our very best to avoid having to impose general nationwide restrictions like another circuit breaker. 
Singapore citizens from 12 to 39 years old will have a two-week priority window to book their vaccination appointments, which they can do from tomorrow. Health Minister Ong Kang said that 1.5 million people have yet to get their shots. But with 49,000 doses being administered on a daily basis currently, he said Singapore's vaccination exercise is progressing well. As of 9th of June, more than 4.4 million doses uh, have been administered and more than 2.5 million people of our population have had at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. That means about 44% of our population has received at least one dose of the vaccine. And we are now vaccinating about 49,000 doses on a daily basis and we have the capacity to maintain this acceleration of our vaccine rollout, provided our supplies are steady and continue to arrive. The Health Ministry is advising that those who have recovered from COVID-19 from over six months ago should also receive one dose. This because of evidence indicating that a single dose would further boost their immunity against the virus. This group can register from tomorrow as well if they are part of a population group already eligible. Look at the experience in America as an example. More than 40% of people in America are fully vaccinated, two doses. And about 10% of them have been infected with the virus. So we're talking about an immunity of about 50% or more, slightly more. And with that coverage, Already, you can see their infection rates are steadily coming down. We are not there yet, but we will get there soon. We expect 50% of people in Singapore to be fully vaccinated in August. And by October, we should reach an overall vaccination rate of 75% or hopefully more. So as we progress through these stages, we will ease our restrictions and gradually restore our normal lives, both within Singapore and at our borders. Then we will move to phase three and even beyond phase three to a new normal phase of living with endemic COVID. You'll soon be able to administer COVID-19 tests on your own when DIY test kits hit the Guardian, Unity and Watson's pharmacies from June 16th. More will be progressively sold at other locations. Now, these four antigen rapid test kits have been granted interim authorization for sale to the public here. Each person can only buy 10 kits to ensure adequate supplies for all. The ART self-test kits complement our overall surveillance strategy. These fast and easy-to-use tests allow us to detect infected cases more quickly, in particular among individuals who do not have acute respiratory infection symptoms, but are concerned that they may have been exposed to COVID-19. Regular testing is key to our ability to reopen and will be part of our way of life in future. Testing allows us to detect and isolate cases in the community more quickly and will allow more economic and social activities to continue, even as we detect cases and clusters. Let's delve deeper into today's announcements. I'm joined by infectious diseases physician from the Rofi Clinic, Dr. Leong Ho Nam. Welcome to the show, Dr. Leong. Doctor, lots of details about the easing of restrictions um, mentioned today. What's your assessment of how this reopening is done, say compared with how we transitioned from phase two to phase three last year? Looks like we've lost uh, the audio from Dr. Leong. Doctor, are you able to hear us? Okay, wait. Okay, there you go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Singapore, give yourself a big, uh, big clap and give yourself a big, uh, uh, okay. Th this is great. I think this is, you have done brilliantly well, Singapore. I'm very proud of you. Compared to last year when we opened up, we are much, much better now. 
We've done it over from a two month period, which restricted down to one month period. That is great job, Singapore, you deserve it. Now, why is it that we were able to do it? Because number one, all of us were a lot more cooperative. We had a lot more masks that were set up. Number three, we went for SWOT testing. Testing is the key to it. And number four, we have very good contact tracing. Contact tracing in terms of trace together, finding everyone linking up together. So that made a big difference and the acceleration is very good. However, you did realize that our minister didn't give us the cake and eat it. You can have a group of five people, you have the cake there, but you can't eat it on the spot. In fact, you have to eat it back at home or something. But it tells you that we are going to open up again in stages. To be really fair, we are very worried because the virus is highly transmissible. We don't know if we open up too quickly, will it re result in a big flare of cases? And remember, food, food, food. When we sit down and have our restaurant and enjoy ourselves and dig into the food, we're going to chat and eat without our masks on. The risk of transmission to the people around us is high and the people outside at the ventilation area. So I could be sitting here at our table on the other side and I maintain my two meters distance, but the air ventilation could just shift all the virus over to the other side. Hence the reluctance to have dining in open now. So we have that on the 21st of June and I'm happy that they're holding back on gym as well because in gym, you'll be huffing and puffing and you might be sharing your virus all around. Doctor, I want to borrow your analogy on, you know, you said having your cake but can't quite eat it yet. Now, the task force said more rules will be relaxed come June 21st. That is uh, one week after uh, some rules have been eased uh, on the 14th. Now, if the situation remains under control, of course. Doctor, so I want to ask, how do we determine that the situation is under control? And conversely, what could cause any setbacks? The... I will look at the number of unlinked cases. I've talked about it previously in the previous era. And in comparison, I say it's as long as there were less than five unlinked cases, I'm happy. But the virus is highly transmissible. And you notice the number of clusters there are. And you will probably realize that there were super spreading events a lot more than last year, which means uh, we have to be a little bit more careful. And the numbers I'm looking at is just zero or one unlinked cases consistently thereafter. With these numbers, we can actually contain and do the uh, contact tracing well and quick. The second thing is that we need to have consistently negative PCR. So we're doing about 50 to 80,000 PCRs every day. We should have less than 10 positives or uh, less than 10 positives at any one time. These two markers, if they are there, Singapore, you are high and dry. Doctor, I want to talk about now the um, recommendation by the Health Ministry. Now, MOH recommended that those who have recovered from COVID-19 should get a single dose of the vaccine. When an infected person recovers, uh, presumably there is already the presence of antibodies. Doctor, help us understand, how would a single dose help? And added protection of uh, sorts, perhaps? Great question. I love it very much. It boils down to the amount of antibody levels you have. If you have a natural infection, you have so much, but that is not enough. When you have a natural infection, uh, you have so much antibodies, but when you have a second dose of vaccine, it boosts it up really, really high. So I'm going to try to plot out a graph for you, imaginary graph for you. If you have one dose of COVID-19 vaccine as an mRNA, you have so much antibodies, but when you have a natural infection, it goes slightly higher. When you go for two doses of anti uh, vaccines, you is even slightly higher than natural infection. But that's not the maximum antibodies you can get. In fact, you get the maximum antibodies when you have a natural infection plus one dose of vaccine and you really, really hit the top. When you hit the top, you are able to cope with many more of the variants much better. Number two, and studies have shown if I have a natural infection, I have one dose of vaccine, I have such high levels, by giving another dose, it doesn't make a difference in antibody levels. So those have been infected, one dose and you get massive amount of antibodies, the second dose after that is not needed. 
In other words, you can save that precious vaccine for somebody else. It, at the end of the day, to overcome the virus is a numbers game. The greater the number, the more efficient you are at getting rid of the virus. Doctor, another announcement that uh, the Multi-Ministry Task Force uh, said today that from June 16th, DIY COVID-19 test kits can be bought over the counter and people can test themselves. If they get a positive result, they should immediately see a doctor to get a confirmatory PCR test. Doctor, how can this be enforced though? I, I think it's going to be really difficult. It boils down to complete honesty. Uh, uh, Rianto, I think you really hit the nail uh, on the spot with that question. If we do the test, I found out to be positive. I refuse to accept it because of the stigma of the illness. I keep quiet. I don't share it out. Guess what? You are going to hurt yourself because you're going to get worse and you do not get medical treatment early. You're going to hurt your family members because you transmit the virus on to them. And because you want to go back to work to appear to be normal, you may pass it on to other commuters on board the train, on the bus, or to your workplace. So the best thing is this, honesty is the best policy. If you do a swab test and it comes out positive, declare yourself to the authorities so that you get treatment and you actually contain it. And mind you, find the source. Who, who gave you that virus? Find the person and then prevent further transmission because that's the duty of a good Singapore citizen. We all have to do our part for our country. Doctor, just to round up our discussion today, any final words or comments for our viewers right now? Singapore, you've done a fabulous job and I'm extremely, extremely proud of you. I, I, I couldn't imagine that we could come out four weeks. In fact, some of my predictions was that I will extend out two weeks. But Singapore, you've proved me long and I love you for that. Going forwards, I think it's going to be more, more tricky. We need to get all the vaccination rates up as quickly as possible. Number two, be prepared. After this Delta virus, there's going to be an Epsilon virus. There's going to be the next character and it's going to be even more transmissible. And as, as what the minister say, we need to get ready for endemic living. Not tomorrow, not next month, but now. We need to be prepared that COVID-19 will live consistently with us for the years to come. We have lost the war, so we have learned to overcome it, live with it day by day. And when we do it so responsibly to myself, to my fellow Singaporeans, from vaccination to testing and being responsible by seeing doctors, I will show love to my fellow Singaporeans. Singapore, I love you. Well done. As always, thank you for your time, Doctor. I've been speaking with Dr. Leong Ho Nam, infectious diseases physician from the Rofi Clinic at Mount Elizabeth Novena. Now, meanwhile, Singapore reported four new cases in the community today. Two of them are linked to previous cases and the other two are currently unlinked. Nine imported cases were also confirmed, seven being Singaporeans or PRs. Now, more details will be released tonight. With today's announcements, gyms and fitness studios will have to wait another week or so to find out if they can resume their indoor operations. In the meantime, how have they been coping with the tighter restrictions? Multimedia journalist Fazana Friday spoke to a few gym owners. It has been a turbulent time for Singapore's gym and fitness industry. Some good news came in the government relief measures announced on May 28th included subsidies from the Job Support Scheme and rental rebates from the Rental Support Scheme. While some gyms the Straits Times spoke to welcomed the GSS subsidies, not all staff benefit from the measures. In order to pay her team, Grace Huang, co-founder of martial arts gym New Fit, is not taking a salary. It was just financially really tough for us. Um, and we were only just starting to get our groove back and then get hit by this again, it was, it, it, it's a big blow. Lah. How to keep this family together, how to pay everyone, how to stay afloat, you know, that, that, that was really my biggest, my biggest worry. To be honest, JSS doesn't really help us much because a lot of the fitness industry runs on freelancers. So, um, GSS only works if you've got like full-timers on board. I, I'm not envious of any of them on the task force at all. This is a tough job, I don't want to do it. You know, but I think 
kind of understanding this industry a little bit more would be really helpful. These fitness spaces are managing to survive, though restrictions have seen a drop in footfall. Spartan Boxing Gym in Tai Sing had planned its grand opening for early May, but that has been pushed back indefinitely. To stay in operation, it offers private indoor and outdoor one-on-one -on -one boxing sessions as well as online classes. We are very thrilled with the support from the government. It's a huge help for us and also for other businesses that's going through the same thing as us. We were, we were opening up really well on the first day. We were happy, you know, jovial. The coaches were killing it in the gym. Members were happy, were smiling. Then it took a dip when we got to know the news. I mean, to be honest, it's been very quiet, the gym. And also, interest in the gym has had, made, uh, has, has had a significant dip. But at the end of the day, we're in a global pandemic. So we do our best to adapt to the changes that's been made and to follow closely with what the government says to ensure that we have safe classes. So the fitness industry has been tremendous, the community itself the unity and the help that we've been giving each other and also with newer gyms that opened up then we can help them out also with our experience but at the end of the day, tough times don't last, tough people do. Now quick look at other headlines. Former students of Ni An Poly lecturer Tan Boon Lee have come out accusing him of racially and religiously insensitive behaviour in class. Mr Tan first made headlines a few days ago for his disparaging and racist remarks towards an interracial couple. His ex-student Nurul Iskandar said that in July 2017, Mr Tan had started an offensive discussion about Islam during lesson time. Ms. Nurul recounted this incident in an Instagram post yesterday. And elaborating on her experience to ST today, she said, quote, I remember that he opened up websites about Islam and explained why he didn't agree with certain Quranic verses. He then singled me out and tried to start a debate on the topic. It didn't help that I was the only Muslim student in class and I sat in the front row. Now, she also said that since putting up the post, more accounts about Mr Tan from other students have come to her attention. Meanwhile, President Halima Yaakob said on Facebook that recent incidents of hatred and chauvinism have shaken Singaporeans' belief in hard-won cohesion. Calling such displays hurtful, she wrote, quote, It's agonising to read about the incidents of hatred and chauvinism perpetrated by Singaporeans against each other. Madam Halima also noted that the law on its own wouldn't stop such incidents from perpetuating. Instead, she's advocating deeper engagements about the importance of cohesion and how to achieve a truly multiracial and multi-religious society. Six months after exiting Singapore, Robinsons is making a comeback as an online mall. Going live on June 24th, it will feature more than 200 brands and collaborations. Robinsons also announced today that it was acquired by wholesale supplier Canningville Australia this month. Headquartered in Singapore, the new business will be led by Jordan Prinito, Canningville's former MD. A building collapse in Mumbai has left at least 11 people dead, including eight children. Another eight people were found injured and have been taken to the hospital, with officials saying more could be trapped inside the debris. Building collapses in Mumbai became, become more common during the monsoon, and yesterday was the first day of heavy rains in the city. Meanwhile, India Today reported the highest single-day COVID-19 death toll in the world at 6,148. This comes as the eastern state of Bihar revised its figures to account for people who died at home or in private hospitals. More than 359,600 people have died from COVID-19 in India, with its total cases now standing at 29.2 million. As Australia's Victoria State locks, looks to lift its lockdown in a few hours, it reported four new local cases today, compared with one case a day earlier. Meanwhile, two other states, now New South Wales and Queensland, are on alert after an affected woman and her husband travelled from lockdown Victoria. 
Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison is currently in Singapore to meet Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong to discuss areas of bilateral cooperation. The two leaders are expected to discuss the COVID-19 situation as well. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman. See you tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.